All right. So you already seen me a little bit before. Uh, I had a quick introduction to uh, NativeScript CLI. Uh, but now I want to talk to you about code sharing, which I find uh, quite dear to me. And it's about like how do we do code sharing between web and native mobile. So it's literally using Angular for web applications or and, and bridging it with native script. That's the whole idea. So my name, oops, I have a clicker. Um, my name is Sebastian Vitalitz, um, and if any of you is on Twitter, I'm Seba Vita, and the pictures are appreciated. I'm not gonna beg, that's it. Um, and I, I work for Progress as a, what is it, a developer advocate, and NativeScript is uh, the technology I, I like the most, pretty much. Um, so let me get into it. Usually before we even get like about the whole code sharing thing, like we start with why do we even need to do native or mobile, right? So native applications are usually uh, for, for situations where you keep reusing the same services over and over again, right? So if you have this mobile application for, that tells you the, time, uh, the train times, right? You'll be using this application a couple of times a day, every day of, of, of the week. Pretty much. So, and mobile applications are well known for kind of like uh, people coming back to them and reusing them over and over again. And you can see, like, on average, people spend like 80 times more with mobile applications versus websites. Okay? Uh, so, mobile apps are pretty good for that. However, web applications are more for wider reach. Right? So, imagine uh, you went to Amsterdam and you want to go to a muse museum. You're not going to download a mobile application just to go there once, right? You're gonna open a website on your phone and you wanna access it and, and check out uh, what's going on. So web applications are more for the wider reach, right? So like if, if you look at it, uh, like you, you pretty much have like three times more unique visitors on websites versus using mobile applications. But the whole thing is not about one versus the other, but about combining them together, right? Because still the very same museum in Amsterdam might have people who live there that want to go there quite regularly, okay? So the whole story is about using web for wider reach and mobile for this uh, richer experience for people that keep coming back to you and finding the best solution for, for it all, okay? So like what we're aspiring to is pretty much this scenario where we use Angular with NativeScript as well, like to do Android, iOS, and then web applications. So we have to look a little bit at like some of the key differences and they're not pretty huge, but like but versus one and the other. Uh, so one of the things that we look like, even the project structure is kind of like already slightly different. Uh, so for example, in a web application, like all your code will be inside source app. In terms of native script, everything you see is in the app folder. So like some of the tooling might already have some mismatch. Uh, there might be some problems. Uh, another thing is build tools. So, Angular uses Angular CLI at the moment. NativeScript uses NativeScript CLI. So again, like if you're used to using uh, Angular CLI, all the scaffolding and everything, well, that doesn't exist in NativeScript CLI. That's a bit of a problem sometimes. Uh, and then as well, like the biggest difference really is what goes in the UI. So your components that you're using, the styling, like what would you actually see and interact with is different between one and the other. But actually, as much as these are the key differences, they, I don't consider them necessarily problems. It's just they're different, right? So if you look at it like in, in general, like if you look at whole structure of uh, Angular uh, and then you have mobile application, web application, uh, the biggest difference like around here, for example, we have the markup where our HTML goes. Uh, so the HTML for web application will be different to the one for mobile app. And the same thing is when you're trying to use CSS, when you want to style your application, uh, then your CSS for web is different to the one that you use uh, for, a, for a mobile application. However, uh, you can draw the same kind of uh, properties, the same theme colors, etc., uh, from the same common SAS file, okay? And then when things are really coming together is when we have components, where we have our own pipes, rules, where we have the, the services that drive our applications, uh, maybe you can have a service that drives on top of like some uh, on top of HTTP, and then you can start looking to code sharing. Okay, that's that's pretty much the idea. So what we can really share, like we're looking at pretty much like all our TypeScript code that we have out there, like our specific Angular components, pipes, routes, uh, directives. We can reuse that, 
and like huge chunks of uh, SAS uh, that we have. It's, it's just basically picking the right properties uh, to, to style maybe your text field versus input on the other, right? But it could all come from the same source, okay? So what are the possible solutions to, to kind of achieve the code sharing? Um, I, I kind of see two, I mean, there's loads of them, but I see two very distinctive solutions. Uh, so one is approach number one, like with multiple projects, right? So we create ourselves like the shared platform agnostic code, like folder, right? So that folder will have like our services, components, pipes, directions, like all, all this kind of very shareable items of Angular. And then we create two separate projects, right? So we have our Angular web project and our Angular native script project. And then we can copy that sharing folder into each of them. So pretty much they're like the copy of each other. And then we can write separately the web code and the mobile code. And you basically have two applications that kind of like have this big shared part of it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty like doable. Like anyone could, if you know how to do a web application or a mobile application, you could just uh, sort it out really quickly, right? But let's have a look at the pros and cons or how I see it the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? So the good thing about it is like, it's super easy to set up, right? Like everybody knows how to scaffold a project native to Google web. Uh, it's pretty good for small projects. So if you wanna do something like to release on Wednesday, you know, starting from today, and it's only like a couple of screens, yeah, sure, be my guess. And there's like no learning curve. If you, na if you know native script already, and if you know like Angular for web already, it's like, you just create two projects, copy things, and you're ready to go. The but, well, you have the code duplication, and this doesn't really scale. Like as soon as you, you end up like say, oh, I, I need five screens or 50 screens or whatever, you have a massive mess of synchronization, pooling, and all that. It's like, it, it gets ugly. The whole maintenance is ugly of that, right? And by the way, I chose this color because I find that grayish, the gradient pretty ugly. So that's on purpose. <laughs> it's ugly. It's meant to be ugly. So that's one approach, all right? The other approach, which I like a lot more, is more of like a, you have a monorepo, a single project, right? Like a lot of the rings, like one to rule them all. So we have our monorepo, and then inside that project, we create like uh, all our, you know, Angular specific items. And for example, yeah, like we have our SAS variables inside a project, uh, but then we have two uh, style sheets, like one for web, one for native script. Uh, then we would create components. And each of those components will have like shared uh, TypeScript code, uh, but then we'll have separately um, the, the two versions of HTML, okay? And then we maybe we'll have modules. And those modules have like a bunch of components. You have uh, the, the routing file for navigation, uh, but then uh, the web, ng module for web will be different for, to the ng module for native script because there might be some things that uh, you might do different imports, okay? So this is kind of like how we scaffold the project, right? Like all of it is just uh, bashed in together, okay? So the next thing is like in order to actually make any sense out of it, we need some sort of build process. So that build process, for example, if you wanna build uh, an Angular application for web, uh, would exclude the native script files and then pull just the, the red ones or the common ones and then generate as a result a web application or do the other thing where we exclude the web specific files, pull the native script one, and we generate the native script project out of that, right? That, that's the pretty much the concept of having like a monorepo. So let's, again, pros and cons, or as I say, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, you can actually reuse Angular CLI in here, and actually you can reuse some of it for both, because if I have my project in one place and I create a, a service, this service is automatically used for both platforms, okay? Uh, it's pretty good for complex projects and everything is one place, so it's very maintainable, right? Like you know what is going on, you don't have to be switching between folders, etc. Uh, the bad thing is, obviously, it's an overkill for small projects. If you have an application that has two screens, like the complexity of the build tool will be bigger than the actual project, right? So for a small project, not, not necessarily the best solution and the fact that you need this additional build process that's usually a challenge, okay? Which is a challenge accepted already by us. Uh, and the ugly is pretty much how do I even start, right? Like how do I even, like, 
okay, yeah, fine, you give me the monorepo, but how do I do the monorepo thing, right? Like it sounds nice in theory. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of uh, project seats. Like Nathan Walker, like uh, he created one of them, which is uh, uh, called like the advanced native Swift seed, which is pretty cool, but it's very advanced. Uh, my personal, like the current favorite is the, this one, the Angular native seed, which is a very simpler, uh, a lot simpler version of, uh, of Nathan's. A lot simpler, yeah. So it's a lot easier to as well get started. So it's created by uh, this uh, guy's the team maestro. So you can go to GitHub. Uh, by the way, I'll be sharing the slides as well. But you can go and create it, and it's super easy to get started. And I will later on show you how to code against it as well. Okay, so let's have a look how this specific monorepo works. So we have our Angular Native Seed monorepo. Uh, and if we want to build a web application with that repo, like what are the steps that you need to know? It's actually the way I see it is business as usual. So what you do is you run ng-surf from the root of your project, which will run it through Angular, uh, Angular build tools, which will generate your web project out of that. You know? So you just run ng-surf and you're ready. Right? It's pretty cool. So for a web developer, no difference. Uh, but then if you want to use the same project for, for native script, um, it has this custom build that I mentioned before. So we have two commands. Either we could run npm run Android or npm run iOS. So notice we, we're not calling TNS, we're running npm. Uh, and this will kind of do two steps. Step number one, you run this monorepo through a gulp process. So that gulp build will go pick up the, either the common files or the native script specific ones and you construct a native script project for you. And then as a second step of that npm uh, run, it actually calls uh, TNS to, you know, so it uses native, native CLI to perform the actual build, okay? So you can either run the NPM run uh, iOS or NPM run Android, or you could actually in execute each of those steps in the, in independently yourself because those scripts are already provided out of the box, All right? So how do we co do the code splitting then using this specific um, monorepo? So if we look at our component, and so we have like our TypeScript file for the class and then we have two HTML files. Uh, so our component, let's call it name component, would then have these three files, name.component.ts, name.component.html, so far nothing new, and then name.component.tns.html. So we use this .tns to specify this is a native script file, okay? And the Go process can pick it up. Uh, if you wanna add uh, CSS to it, well, so the styling will pretty much be the name.component.scss or namecomponent.tns.scss. And even if you, for example, said, well, I don't even want to share this file, you could literally have another file called name.component.tns.ts. And then you could actually say, you know, I have two versions of it. So maybe that one component will have nothing shared except for the name, right? It's, but it's possible, it's up to you to choose, all right? So what are the challenges? Uh, and then those are challenges in general uh, that you would have when it comes to code sharing. And I'm gonna start with the big one, which like literally takes half of my presentation. Funny that, huh? Um, so the challenge number one is when you have two different libraries and the API just doesn't match. It's just different, okay? Um, and then you could kind of resolve those API differences in two ways, you can either the services that you, that you create, let's say you have a user service, you could have two copies of the same service uh, and then one basically implements against the web API, the other against the native web API. Or you could create a higher abstraction, an abstraction on top of, um, of those APIs, create like a common layer and then create a service that talks to it, right? So let's have a look. So imagine we have a service that talks to some database in the cloud, right? Uh, so we have a web plugin and we have a native script plugin. So then we basically could create uh, two separate services, uh, which then b would implement the same business logic twice. However, the service itself will, will take care of the differences between the different APIs. Like, I mean, this is usually a lot simpler to create, but then the fact that you have to implement the business logic twice is, is kind of problematic. Uh, but it's simple for like, let's say if you have just a user service that has just calls function login, and register, like there's no point in creating something bigger on top of it, right? So it's pretty fun. So you build those two services so that they follow the same API. Like ideally you'd make them inherit from the same interface. And then 
From that, your components talk to this common interface service and basically your build process will give you either one or the other at the build time. Right? And then this will follow the, the right route. So that's one way. The other way, way is the higher abstraction. So for suicidal people like me, uh, I prefer this. So what you do is basically you create yourself a wrap, uh, a, a two wrappers. So you have like a web plugin wrapper, a native script plugin wrapper, which have the common interface. So at this point, there is no service just yet. And then you have your data service with the business logic that talks to the common layer of, of the wrapper, which then talks to the components. Okay, so, so that's like another way. And usually this approach is like quite good for reusability. So if you find yourself using these specific plugins uh, for talking to your uh, data in the cloud over and over again, that's actually better to do it this way because then you can reuse this wrapper all across your projects, uh, which is very, very useful. All right. So one example, which is pretty big, is how the Angular Fire 2 is implemented versus NativeScript plugin Firebase. They're very different. They both talk to the same thing, but the implementation is very, very different. And, and I chose it because uh, there's, it has a, a lot of mini challenges within, cha within the big challenge, right? Like I call them issues, right? So issue number one, two different user models, okay? So for example, the, when I log in or, and I will get the user object, the, the both web and mobile will give me UID, email, verified email, and then refresh token properties, which is fine. But then the problem starts where the dis like on web I get display name, on mobile I get name, right? I get photo URL or profile image URL. And all of a sudden my world collapses, right? Because if I are trying to bind to one or the other, I have to do a lot of if statements and it's messy, okay? So the solution to that is pretty much we should define like a, a unified mod data model and then create a parser that basically brings both of them into like the common denominator. So if we have both of the user models, we run some sort of parser which basically brings both of them into the same model, okay? And I'm pretty sure you already figured out red web, blue native swift, black common, right? That, that'll, be, that'll be repeating over and over again. It's like the visual aid. Uh, it helps me for sure. Uh, so here's an example of, uh, and I'll jump in the code later, uh, that's, I created an abstraction over Firebase, over these two plugins. So this is what I did. I created a um, common one, and like this is my Firebase user I created. And then for example, a parse uh, function, parse user function for me, for, at least from the native script side, will take a user object, which is the, the one provided by the native script plugin, and then basically I'm, I'm assigning, so like user.name is assigned to display name or the phone number, I'm actually casting the, the phone number, or I'm at attaching photo URL to user profile image URL, right? So by just having a simple uh, parser, I, I already can uh, you know, log in on both sides and then get consistent objects, right? So I can, use, I can deal with it. And if, the, if I don't get any data, I just return null, because reasons. Um, and then using the parse function is just as simple as like, oh, so I call Firebase login, I get the re re result, and I just say this dot parse user. So every function then that I, I kind of do the wrapper for, I just use this uh, parse user whenever user gets returned. And it works like magic. All right, second one. So one, Angular Fire uh, 2 uses observables, right? We watch, we observe what's going on there. Um, the, the native script plugin actually uses listeners, so it goes like, hey, what's going on, right? Like, it kind of looks the same, but it's different. It's just like, it creates some headaches. Uh, so what really happens, uh, we have two approaches. So like the, the above one, if I want to get some data from, let's say, path slash items, uh, so I'm injecting Angular Fire database uh, service, so I can call like af.object and get that, and this will return and items like observable. If I want to do that with uh, the native script plugin, I actually call, have to call add value event listener and then provide a hook function that kind of like every time uh, I run it through, I have to update my data. Um, you know, then if I want to start listening to this, I have to call subscribe, unsubscribe. Uh, in order to start, I call this. In order to stop listening, I have to call uh, remove event listener. So it's like the behavior is very different, right? And then 
The solution really for me was to convert that listener from native script into an observable, right? I was like, I'm a big fan of observables. So if I have to bring them both together to one thing, it has to be observable, no questions asked. Anyone wants to fight over it, we'll do it after. So the way to do it, like I don't know how much you know about observables, but it's really, really simple. So what I have to do is like create a new observable uh, and I pass it like, which basically in my constructor I have to provide a subscriber. So subscriber is this object that I could kind of say subscriber dot uh, next and I'm just, every time I have new values, I just pass it to the subscriber. And the subscriber basically notifies the world about the changes, okay? So I start with that. The second step then is like, I set up myself like a, the event listener, uh, kind of um, like a handle. So that would be what I would use to unsubscribe later. And in here, I'm calling add value event listener. And I'm not showing this code just yet, but then what I'm doing is I'm catching the specific listener from, uh, from this function. So then I could use this event listener later on to unsubscribe. Um, and then inside my add value event listener, I'm actually using ng-zone. Um, like, I don't want to get too much into the Angular stuff, but basically um, this event listener will run outside of zone. So if there's any updates happening here, uh, we need to use the zone to notify the UI. If we don't have that, like your, your observer will be uh, you know, returning values, but the UI will not do anything. So we just need that. So what really happens is, we, we're running the event listener, and every time we get a new piece of data, we just call subscriber.next, and we pass in that data through in there. And then the final step is basically, uh, this, this one is when whoever uses this observable, when they unsubscribe, we wanna remove the event listener. This is our cleanup function, okay? So pretty much in these few lines, I turn my listener uh, the one with add event listener and then remove, uh, and then I turn it into an observable, which is pretty neat. So that's cool. Um, that was the first thing I, I had to do. But then I realized that the Angular Fire observable is not such a basic observable. It's like an observable with a star, it's like upgraded one, you know, version two. Uh, so what they had is basically this thing uh, when, when I basically, uh, let's say, get an observable, like so I could say uh, this.af object, and I get speakers robomaster, and it will give me like an items observable object. This object has additional functions on top of it, which don't normally exist on observables, right? So it has a function called set, so I can set the value like the name and the Twitter to Sebastian and Sebavita. Uh, then I can call update, so I can change the name to Sebi. And then finally I can remove myself because you know, I had too much to drink of water and I had to go. Uh, but anyway, those functions don't exist on observable, on the, on the standard observable. So like, because this is a Firebase object observable. So again, like I had to create a wrapper over the native, native script observable. Uh, so basically the way I had to do it is I had to, I, I basically created like a Firebase object which is like, just follows them and then kind of like create a wrapper for on, on both sides. Uh, so all I had to do is just take the first observable that I created in the step, the previous step, and then when somebody subscribes to it, I'm just subscribing to the other observable and I'm just forwarding all the updates. And then when, when somebody unsubscribes for this one, I'm just unsubscribing from the original one. And then as, uh, because this is one big class, then I could add my set update and remove functions. And now I have basically unified uh, object where basically I could set update and remove on both the uh, web version of it and the native script version, right? So I can start playing with it. Um, and then a similar thing, yeah, I have to kind of wrap uh, the web version of the plugin. All right, so that's like, I was, I was kind of like really hyped up by then because I was like, I'm almost there, right? Like I, I, I wrapped all the listeners, all the observables, and I just tried to use the list, and I found another issue where the way the list observer was worked, they, they didn't quite have the same behavior, okay? So the web list observable, when you subscribe, every time there, is a, there was a change to the data uh, on the Firebase side, I would get a, a whole new array, okay? In native script, when I was listening, 
it would just return the changes. So if you remove the record from Firebase, uh, all I would have get here is just, hey, the record got removed. So I had to again like uh, go and, and wrap that uh, and then create like a new update and remove properties around it. So I had to take this list observable from, from native script and then make it so that it returns a whole array every time. Um, so the code is pretty much uh, simple. So uh, I'm subscribing to, to those changes. And whenever I see that something either got added or changed, I have this um, items map. So basically I'm just setting the key and the value each time they changed. Or if it's just removed, I'm removing it from there. Right? So basically I'm using that items as, as a reference so that I, I always keep it updated. And then finally, uh, whenever there's a change, so I, I, I submit the changes, I turn the values into an array, and then I, I call next on it. So like, hey, here's a new value, right? And then finally, uh, in, the, in the cleanup function, I'm just clearing the uh, items and then unsubscribing. So again, manage to bring the behaviors together. So it's kind of like, this part of the talk was more about like, uh, two APIs fighting versus each other. It was not even like code sharing, right? It was like, you know, these guys are so split, but those are challenges you'll be facing, right? And you have to, you know, take decisions on how to bring them together if you wanna solve them at a higher level. But then now after doing that, I could actually uh, use my Firebase plugin into any, in any project I want. Uh, so I'll, be, I'll put it on GitHub uh, very soon and you all be able to use it if Firebase is something you wanna use, okay? Um, another challenge that we have that is away from Firebase. So in native script, we, we extend some of the objects, okay? So if you, for example, use the router for navigation, so you can, you know, inject router, say, router.navigate, provide a path, and that navigates to another path, okay? In native script, we have router extensions. Um, I think we have a, uh, there's a slide for it. So we have router extensions. So if using the router extensions, I could call this router.navigate, I can provide a path, but I can also provide a transition. So I say, when you navigate, I want you to flip the screen over half a second, yeah? So that would pretty work. So if I now have a service that inside I, I wanna navigate, and it's like the same file for both web and mobile application, this is gonna work like a dream on native script. For web, I'm gonna get this error because TypeScript is gonna complain. It's like, hey, um, Navigate doesn't have transition. What are you doing? It was like, it would scream at you like in silence, but it would scream, you know? <laughs> like I turned off all the color because all, otherwise it would be all red, you know? It'd be havoc, blood, blood everywhere. So again, what, what, what do we do? Like I had to create a wrapper around it. So I, I basically checked the extensions um, uh, API and I realized there's an interface for navigation options and navigation transitions. So I included them into like uh, my uh, navigation service for, uh, for website of it. And then I wrapped the navigation service. So like I have this navigate function that can take both the navigation extras and the native to specific ones, which is navigation options. So then if I run this code um, in a web application, yeah, I was still passing the transition, but that transition would get ignored and TypeScript will not complain. Uh, and then for, for the same version in native script, I didn't have to do any extra magic, but just like to keep consistent, uh, I have, you know, I'm basically ex uh, propagating the navigate so I can call this router don't navigate. So as a result, I actually have navigation.service.ts for web, and then I have navigation.service.tns.ts, see? So I'm using this trick of .tns to kind of manage the differences. But I am doing the navigation service just in one place rather than solving it everywhere I use it, right? I, I just solved this problem once. The problem is gone, right? No more blood. Uh, unless you're donating, that's different. Um, so basically we can use, instead of the router, we could inject the navigation service and then we can just call navigation service dot navigate, provide a path, let's say clear history, and that will work. It won't clear the history on a web project, but it won't crash. So that's, that's a bonus. Another challenge, and actually that's not so much a challenge as something you do all the time. Uh, we all talked about UI for native script, right? Uh, well, if you wanna add it to your Angular project, you have to declare it in your modules. 
Well, you can't declare it in your web project, right? I mean, obviously. So one, one of the other examples was I was working in this demo project and I wanted to do infinite scroll. In Adescape, you just have a list view, which you can have like uh, on, you know, uh, when you reach the screen, uh, you can say load more items, right? In web, there is nothing by default. So there is this plugin called ngx infinite scroll. So you can install in your project. So, but then you have to add it to your project. So what happens is uh, we actually have two ng modules. So there will be, let's say, my uh, app module.ts uh, and app module.tns.ts. So the one for web will have this specific, the unique module for it, and then the natives wouldn't have that module, right? Or you have its own. Or I could have, for example, Angular Material here and the UI for native script here. Why not? So you kind of use this, uh, uh, this separation of .tns or without .tns to, to do that on the ng modules, right? So for example, this will be the, the web uh, ng module where we, when we add the infinite scroll module over here. Uh, and then we can basically call it like uh, creative div and then when scroll to the bottom, we can add more items. Uh, while for native script, we are not importing any additional modules. Uh, we basically just use uh, load more items on the list view. And that works pretty cool. And, and as much as I called it a challenge, right, is basically one of the things you do, right? It's, it's a common practice and uh, that's how you solve it. Um, accessing project root, that's a funny one. Uh, so in, imagine we have this lazy component uh, lazy cat component, because cats are lazy, let's face it, I'm a dog person. Um, so we have uh, this image property of the sleepycat.png. Uh, and then if you want to uh, access the, the like, uh, printed, let's say this image is inside your assets folder. So from, from native script, you'd have to use tilde.slash assets to, to uh, retrieve it. In a web project, you'd have to do dot slash assets. So you see this tilde versus dot is kind of like a bit of a, a, bit of a problem. Uh, so what I did actually, I created uh, an assets pipe. So I mean, because we have two HTML files, it's not a really necessarily a big problem, but if you had uh, some sort of calculation, like a function that retrieves the, uh, the, the name of the file, like as a whole path, then, then you're getting into messy situation. So what I did is actually, I created a pipe called assets so this pipe will take uh, a value and then you return dot slash assets uh, for, for the web project. And then we have the same pipe, which is asset pipe dot TNS dot TS. And this will take the value and then return tilde slash assets. Uh, so then the way we can use it later instead is basically uh, I'm binding to a source. So I'm binding to image, which comes from my class pipe assets or in terms of um, the web project, I'm binding to image again, pipe assets. See, so that pipe sorts out, uh, sorts it out for me. I don't have to remember which one used which, it's just all sorted for me. You know, pipes are cool, you should use them. They're, they're very, very powerful. Uh, so, are there any tools to help me do the magic? Um, yeah, so one of them, so you all know there is, we don't really have uh, a CLI for native script. Uh, sorry, like the Angular CLI, we don't have it in, inside like the core CLI, but I created this extension called native script Angular CLI, and you can install it by calling TNS extension install native script Angular CLI. And this will basically add, surprise, 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 ex an extension to your CLI, new commands, you know? So you can do some cool stuff. So specifically for the code sharing project, there's some commands. So you can call like TNS generate shared component and then give it a name. Or for short, TNS GSC name. And what this will do is uh, generate a component that has uh, two versions of the HTML. But as well, we would generate the TypeScript file, the SAS file, the testing file, all, all sort of it. Uh, we can also call TNS generate shared module name or SM for shared module. And this will actually create the module, we'll have two ng modules, we'll put the component inside and do all sort of uh, crazy stuff for us, which is very, very handy. We're looking at like creating eight, nine different files. This will do it for you, we'll scaffold it, right? And then another trick which I don't have inside this slide, if I run TNS, TNS generate shared component name and then add another attribute here, 
which will be the module name, it will generate a component inside an existing module, which is pretty neat. So let me do a demo. How are we doing on time? I'm flying through it. God. I have to slow down. No, just kidding. All right. So I was working this project. You can see. Uh, this is a serious project, right? Like banking and stuff. Uh, it's based like this, this API called Pet, Petfinder, which works in the US. So like all the pet shelters will register their pets. Uh, and by pets, I mean, you know, pigs, uh, snakes, and cats and dogs too. Uh, yeah, they have all sorts. Anyway, so what I thought it was like, I'm gonna uh, I wrap this service into like, um, um, I call it Petfinder Angular service. So you can get it from NPM if, you, if you're interested. Uh, but I wanted to use it together with Firebase. So I could use the Petfinder service to find pets, but Firebase to store uh, my favorite pets and as well to do the authentication so that I can log in and then save the pets I like for the next time, okay? So this is kind of like what I set out to do. So we have like a login page and then after I log in, I have like a list of my pets. So maybe I could cl click on one of them and get into details or I could go say search for pets, you know, find a friend and then give me like a list of pets and maybe I could choose one and then go and like it, etc. And then similarly, maybe I could go search for shelters. So I could give an address and give me like a list of shelters and I could choose one of them and give me some details about that shelter, right? It's kind of the design. So that's what I set out to do. So let me show you now the project. So the project is, yeah, that's the one, is based on um, the, uh, the team maestro seat that I was talking about before, except I already added like a ton of components. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you very briefly some of the things in, inside here. Let me make it a bit smaller. Uh, so one of the first things is like, I have my Firebase uh, folder here, which is basically a whole abstraction. And, and pretty much you can see that I actually uh, abstracted it out into basically a module. So I can basically have like a version of it for web, a version for it for native script. I'm not gonna get into details. I'll, I'll share the GitHub with you so you can have a look at it. Uh, but the whole idea is that in my, for example, app module, uh, I can import uh, my, oh, actually I have a shared module, even better. Uh, so I have a shared module, and you see I can import the Firebase module so that I can use it everywhere. Uh, and I do it both in the web ng module and the native script one, where I'm actually importing that. So it's like one Firebase module, but they actually do the whole code splitting for me internally. It's hidden away, which is pretty, Cool. Um, all right, so some of the basics around this project. Uh, how the build works. So pretty much if I hide everything, uh, the two main folders that we should look at is either source and native script. So source is where you write all your code. So source will have uh, all my components. So for example, I have my login page or, or login component. You see, and we have uh, the HTML for the web application and I'll have the, the one for native script. So you see this one has a stack layout and a label and a text field and all the stuff you should all, you already know. Uh, but this one has, you know, uh, an H1, a form and a label and an input, right? Uh, but they're all pretty much hooked uh, to the same component. So I'm injecting like the user service, navigation service, and I'm kind of exposing the login register, etc. right? That's the pretty much the idea. Um, so where, so basically if from this folder, I call ng-surf, Angular CLI will build the application, give me the, the project, okay? However, to build a mobile application from this folder, I actually have to go inside native script folder. So native script folder is uh, sim linked uh, to the other one, okay? Uh, but it has some additional stuff and it's got its own packet JSON. So it's, you have its own uh, dependencies and dev dependencies, but as well, it has a whole bunch of additional scripts. So if I run npm run iOS, it will run through this process. So if I look at the prep CLI tablet, it basically runs a gulp process that I mentioned before during my slides. 
Um, so if I, so it runs first, actually let me finish through that. So first you run this gold process and then you run TNS run iOS, okay? Uh, there's another one which is very useful. We could run npm run light sync, which basically continuously will run the gulp whenever there's file changes. So this one is pretty good for, um, you know, continuously making changes and then the whole synchronization happens on both sides. So we have that. And then if I show you the gulp file very quick, quickly without getting too much into details, basically we have a whole bunch of gulp tasks that look for like um, .tns files uh, and then basically this, this what it's supposed to do uh, is, is just going and then renaming all these files. So if you find the .tns file, you rename it to the one without .tns, right? So as a result, uh, by, by going from uh, whatever sits inside, uh, sorry, inside the source folder, we will go and then end up with something that goes to native sip app app and for example, if I show you now the login component, see there is no .tns and our .html actually contains native script code, right? So like the gold process recreates this project separately, right? And then all our files are in the format as they should be uh, for the native script to, to build it correctly with TNS. Um, what else? So the only really time when I go to the native script folder is just from my command line uh, to run the npm commands or if something doesn't quite work and then I'm not sure if it just copied it correctly or not but in general you stay in the source folder all the time okay because that's pr pretty much uh, the advice way of working with it um, okay let's come back login so one of the key things my navigation that the way it's set up uh, so for example by default, I will go to the login page. I have my login component. Uh, for example, I'm using lazy loading. So for the home module or pet search module or the shared search module, all these modules are lazy loaded. And, and that works pretty much uh, for, uh, for the web side of the project and the native script side of the project. And the coolest thing about this as well is there's only just one app.roots. So I'm sharing the navigation between one and the other. I don't have to do it twice. Um, yeah, my app module.tns.ts and I've got two, so they'll import two different HTTP services, etc. but they provide as a result um, the same interface to it all. Um, for example, the app component.tns.html, I'm just setting up page router outlet. The .html one uses the router outlet uh, inside a container and I actually have like a, a, a menu uh, for, for, for displaying just for the web application. I didn't want it in my mobile app. So why don't I just build the project quickly so that you see what I'm talking about? Because I keep talking, but I should show. So if I run ng-serve minus O, so I'm in the root folder uh, to run that. Then in here, I'm in the native script folder. Oops, it's actually opening the website. Let me just run that so I can run npm run iOS just like as a one-off to do the GoPro. So I'm, I'm starting with like a, a login page. And this app is not finished just yet. Like it's not pretty, but it works. That's the important thing, right? It's about code sharing. I, I need a designer to uh, make it prettier for me. Anyway, so I can log in. And then this kind of takes me to uh, my home page, which has like favorite pets um, that I have. You know, I have Coco, I have Lily, some horses, you know, there's everything. Um, and then similarly, when I build, I think it's still building the application for native. Yep, still building it. It's about to, ooh, too big. Launch it. Let's see. So I'm starting the login page. This one is slightly different. Nice buttons. I can do some design. And then displays exactly, let's see, the same list of pets. Um, so I have Alex and I have Delightful Danny, I have Cece because somebody was lazy to give them a proper name um, and I can do similar things like if I for example go to search pets they kind of both use the same navigation uh, let me make it a bit bigger I could for example search for pets uh, so let's search in New York and why any animal so let's look for reptiles because we need some sweet pets and let's for, look for boa constrictor. Fine pets, hey, we got some. 
Uh, making some weird noises. Uh, all right, I'm gonna find some cute pets. Uh, let's go for, actually let's say cute and I'm going for cats. What's wrong with me? All right, let's, let's see, you have some kittens in New York that you could adopt. So for example, I can choose DPT and you see my list view here updated and I have DPT here. I can go and see the details, all right? So they're like both working on the same backend and then at the same time, kind of work. Hey, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm, I know this is pretty shocking stuff, but uh, yeah. Uh, and then in this case, actually I'm using the UI for native script for, for doing like um, the search for pets. So if I wanna do a similar thing, let's look for uh, some barnyard animals. So we could look for a cow. I'm hungry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, let's look for a male cow. Uh, and then we have Cocoa uh, or Trenton. And they're young enough, so like, if you calculate when it's Christmas. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, and then I can like the cow. And the cow, oh, I need to go to homepage. Uh, and it should be somewhere at the bo towards the bottom. Oh, where did it go? No? Didn't get at it. Let's see. I may have broken the app. I, I, I like to do that. Yeah, I probably broke. Oh no, there it is. You have Trenton and Cocoa. Yeah, it's like I have no control over order in which Firebase returns, but yeah, I can go and get some details like, is it ripe? What kind of meat did it? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I didn't say that. I, I then have something similar automatically for uh, shelter. So if I want to go and search for shelters, I actually didn't use UI for this before that for searching. So see, this is the difference when you use proper tools. But I can search for shelters that have horses. Let's say, yeah, Apalosa. Are there any shelters? Yeah, there's a few ones. Apparently, K9 Rescue has horses. Who would have known? Uh, these don't look like horses to me. <laughs> Or you could ride them if you're like a two-year-old, but come on, Leslie, let's go for a ride. No, <laughs> that's terrible. Um, all right, so I showed you the app a little bit and like, you know, how everything is shared and everything, but let me extend the existing project. Uh, so I'm going to do a whole bunch of things. Let's, let me kill everything. Um, so imagine we have, so I was kind of trying to test it out. We have, a, we have petters. People would like to pet the pet, right? And then, you know, so a petter will have an email because you need to find them. They have to have favorite pet. How, how many pets can they pet at a time? <laughs> so apparently I can do seven. I don't know how. Um, and then my name's Sebastian and then I like barnyard animals because reasons. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so let, let me just create something similar. So what we probably have to do uh, I'm going to use the, the CLI I was talking about before. So TNS, generate, uh, shared module, and I'm going to create a module called Petter, right? Uh, and then maybe another one where I'm going to create a Petter list, which would like display all the Petters, uh, and then I want to create it inside Petter. Uh, this command requires one. Oh, because I want to create a component inside. So SC, shared component. Uh, so you see error handling, I have error handling in my plugin, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Even I forget about it sometimes. Uh, so what I, what I have now is this petter folder. So this petter folder out of the box will have uh, the two uh, module files. I also have the petter commons. Uh, so one thing that my plugin doesn't do just yet, it does when I add the component inside a module, it doesn't add the new modules in the ng modules, I have to do it manually. Uh, so for example, I'll probably have to do, like, let's import uh, petter list component from petter list dash petter list, right. So now I can add it to my component declarations. So let's add it to petter list component. Uh, and then what, what you see is like, I have this common file, which has like common component declarations shared modules. So inside my modules, you see, I'm importing those component declarations, right? So I can do it in one place rather than do it twice. 
All right, so I did that. Um, my shared module actually uh, already provides me with UI for native script, but if I wanted to do just here, I could add my UI for native script modules uh, in, in this place. And what I'm gonna do as well, um, because I don't wanna keep going and navigating the same thing over and over again, uh, I need to add a path. So let me add a path uh, to, let's say, uh, Peter. Uh, and then that one I'm going to use lazy loading, so load children, and I'm going to go to app, Peter slash uh, Peter uh, module. So that's where the module file is. And then using uh, lazy loading, so hash, uh, what will be Peter module, because that's the name of the class, right? So that's how I add a lazy loading for this specific module. And I'm going to change the default path so that it always shows uh, the pattern. So just for now, I should be able to run ng-serve. And then on this side, um, I'm actually gonna run the sync command, and then I'm gonna run npm run live sync so that we can keep making changes. And then separately, TN, oof, TNS run iOS. Cool. So now my project, whatever it is, if I reload at the root, yeah, it actually takes me to the pattern, right? Like, so it just displays like pattern.title. And when this reloads, it should as well take me to that page uh, when the build is finished. It's still building. All right. Anyway, while this is do going, let's, let's do some coding. What do we need? Um, so uh, I think in the pattern module, we have as well our roots inside here. So what I can do, let me just put it all in one line. Um, by default, like we always start with the pattern component, but maybe we can also add a new path. So if somebody says, uh, list, I want to navigate to component, uh, component, uh, which is comma, yep, thanks for that. And I want to navigate to Petra list component. And let's use VS Code to help me. Uh, there you go. So now inside I can, if I navigate to pattern slash list, that will, that will go to this specific uh, component. So let's test this out. I can add list and you go, yeah, to the other component. So let's stay here for now. Um, yeah, it worked as well for native script. So let's start with native script. So for the pattern, I, I will need uh, a couple of things. So let's import uh, the Firebase module. And I never remember I created and I already forgot how. So let's go to find a constructor. So to use the Firebase data service, I just have to inject this. So in my pattern component.ts, I'm going to inject the Firebase data service. Uh, and I have to also import it from my app Firebase, okay? Um, so, for example, I could in I could, for example, have uh, oh, I should probably create a model for my pattern. All right, one more thing. So, pattern dot module. Usually, the scaffolding is the the hard part, but I'm gonna just create a class. Uh, export class pattern. It's almost like Peter, but it isn't right. So, like I said, in my Firebase, pattern has an email favorite pet. Oh, where do you go? So email favorite pet max pets. So email string uh, favorite pet uh, max pets. I'm gonna change it to number. Uh, what else do we have? Max pets name and pet type. Name pet type. Right. We have our pet sorted. I don't know. Oh, sec semicolon. All 
I love Touch to be just kind of like highlights all the issues you have. Like, I don't have to wait until I fail. Um, okay, so I'm gonna have an object. So public. Mm, so I will have my petters, which will be unobservable. So again, what did I call it? In my Firebase, I have Firebase list, and that is Firebase list. Okay, let's do that. And this will return pattern for each object. So let's import all of those things. Uh, import pattern. Did I manage to lose you already? Because that is my intention. Just kidding. Uh, well, it is actually. Um, anyway, so after I, I, I'm gonna import my Firebase list, uh, I can start doing some really cool stuff. So inside my ngon init, I can, for example, say uh, my patterns will be this dot Firebase data service, and I want to create a list, uh, and that list should come from, and if I look at it, I, I want to be reading my list from the patterns node. So I was like, okay, give me the list from patterns. And that will pretty much create this special upgraded uh, Firebase observable, right? Um, and then, for example, I can expose another function called add. So in this case, I could say uh, this dot patterns dot uh, set, uh, and then for the key, I'm gonna use this dot. Oh, we need actually a pattern object, All right? So we'll have public pattern of type pattern. Uh, so this one have email, favorite pet, what else? Name. Max pets, name, yeah, name. I love TypeScript, it's just I don't have to remember any of this pet type. I created two minutes ago and I already can forget about it. All right, so I created like an empty petter object. So now whenever I call at, I'll always call this dot uh, petter dot name for the key because names are great keys, uh, and then the actual value will be the pattern itself, right? So far I'm just creating like the old scaffolding and everything, nothing to do with web or mobile, right? So now that I have that, let's create something inside native script then. Um, yeah, I'm gonna keep the stack layout. Let's say I'm gonna add an action bar. Uh, what's wrong over here? Okay, next action bar, and then I'll, I'll call it at petter. So that'll be my action bar. And then inside here, um, I'm gonna use the rat data form. So my source, it is petter, right? It is not Peter, do not mix it, uh, but it's petter. And then for each property now, uh, I can, for example, uh, add like a one property. So one would be, uh, it would be name. So I'm gonna buy to name and I'm gonna display it as name and the index is I wanna display it first. Then I wanna display email. So I'm gonna bind to email, email property from Petter, so petter.email. And the label or the caption is email and I wanna in, set index to one uh, as the second thing. And I can do additional thing where I could actually say, um, I wanna add property editor and this uh, property is email. It kind of works pretty well on the real device. Then if you start typing, it sees all the emails that you have saved on your phone and automatically helps you uh, pick the right one. All right, so we have email. What else? Uh, we have max pets. The best thing is that I don't actually even have to prepare all of them. Like the raw data form will pick up all the rest of them. Um, I did something wrong, did I? Or is it still refreshing? Come on, show me the juice. I want to see it. Um, actually, I'm going to put it into a grid layout because I'm probably... Uh, grid. I'll have two rows. One will be a star and the other one will be auto. And the reason being is like I want to have a button at the bottom. So um, let's put this out. No, I don't want to use Angular service right now. So the red data form will be row zero. 
and then I'll also have a button, and it's button. So uh, I'll call it add, and I'm gonna call the add function here, and that should be row one. Class, let's make it pretty, button, button primary. You see like a lot of code sharing is actually writing specific things either for web or native script. Um, and that should reveal. Interesting. What did I do wrong? Let's see. Oh, I actually have, uh, no, oh, yeah, I realized. Fine. Uh, as much as I said that my shared module was actually importing the, the module, uh, it wasn't uh, for, for the, so pet search module TNS. See, I need to import the native CBY module in my, uh, the new module I'm creating, okay? So petter, petter module dot TNS. I can import this. So I'm importing the native CBY data for module and I'm not gonna add it to the declarations. That's what I was missing. I hope. Reload. Yay. So you see like now I have my form which allows me to say, you know, Sebastian. You see, I didn't even choose the, the type for uh, max pets, uh, but it, because, because it's a number, it kind of picked up on it. Uh, the pet type, um, I could just say dog because I like dogs. Email, say about that, uh, whatever. Email.com, favorite pet, Luca. Actually, I'm gonna use a different one because I already have a record in the database. And if I press now add, using that service, uh, we should get a SEBI record over here, All right? So now following up, following through on the code sharing, let's do the same thing for our web application. So this should basically allow us to add the record as well. Um, we'll see if we have enough time to do the reading. So again, let's see. So I'm going back to petter.component.html, which doesn't really do just that much just yet. Um, and then from here, I mean, maybe we could say h1, at pet, now we all see my, ma my magic uh, HTML. Um, so what do we no do? Uh, we need a name, right? So name, um, I have some uh, ng input. So name we're gonna bind to petter.name. Uh, we're gonna bind to petter.email of type email. What else did we have? Um, max pets type numeric, numeric. That's how we spell numeric. Uh, and then I'll just do one more. Uh, Petter dot component uh, email name. Yeah, let's do favorite type, favorite pet. Actually, I'm gonna do all of them and a pet type. Cool, so that's my input. Um, let's actually say email address here. I could do a drop down and stuff like that, but too much effort right now. Uh, favorite pet, and then finally pet type. And to make it better, I'm also gonna add uh, a button. So button. So in this case, we're not tapping, we're calling a click. So let's bind to a click and I'm gonna call the add function and I'm gonna say add the new petter. All right, let's see if that works. Wow, it's ugly. Let's see, let's add some breakpoints. We're going to the extremes of my design skills right now. Appreciate it, it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, the numeric didn't work, did I do it right? As a number. Yeah, now I can do up, all right. So I have Nathan, 
over here. Nathan at I am so amazing dot com. I can pet hundred seventy fifteen. Let's not, ex not, not let's not exaggerate. And the favorite pet is Sebi because he treats me like that. And I'm a meerkat. And if I add call add, then we should get a new petter over here, which is Nathan, etc. So like, I know it's not like a huge example, but like you, I, I took you through the process of like how I could use the, the scaffolding uh, to create a new component or the whole module, set up the lazy molding, set up the root at the, at the bottom. Then in my component, I set up like the functionality, right? So I had my model, I had my add function, and then separately I created two HTMLs. That's where the real difference was. And yeah, I had to go to the TNS module to add the UI for native script because it's only native script that was using it, right? I mean, like, it looks a bit scary, but like once you sit down and kind of like follow this process, so I'm glad this gets recorded, like you could go step by step with me uh, and then try to kind of uh, achieve that. And, and trust me, um, me working on this project with these pets is actually, a, it was quite a pleasant experience. So once I had, for example, this abstraction in terms of Firebase, you seen like how little effort it was. Like I, I was just injecting that uh, Firebase uh, uh, data, read, uh, data service and I was just able to do everything. You didn't see me doing anything web specific or mobile specific in that service, uh, in that component. And of course for adding uh, petters, I should create a petter service, but uh, we, we don't have a, like, you know, two hours to do that. Uh, but that's the, cool, the, the, the core idea. Um, so let me get back to the presentation. Let's see. So I have a few more slides and then I'll hand over to Nathan. Uh, so code sharing goals and plans, because this is like an ongoing process. It's not by, we didn't finish the whole story just yet. There's more work to do. Uh, but we're richly in a stage where uh, those things I was showing you, you can already use it in production, right? It's not just like an alpha version of like, you know, some idea. Uh, so the guys from the team, uh, the team Maestro, they're using this particular project, this particular seed to build an application that has, you know, a tens or up to a hundred components and services and stuff. So they're using it for a big project, okay? Um, so what are the goals? Um, we have to close down some of the gaps. Uh, so we'll be working on the integration with the Angular CLI. So all those things you've seen me when I had to use uh, TNS to create shared components, shared modules, et cetera, we are looking to, for you to be able to do that with the, na na through the Angular CLI. So you'll be able to actually call ng, uh, the exact syntax of how you generate them, it hasn't been decided, but I'll work with the Angular team to achieve that. Okay, uh, and there'll be some effort, but the Angular CLI is about to enter the phase which will make it extensible, right? So we will definitely jump on that train. Um, this specific project we see it as like, we should move away from the gulp build into a webpack build, okay? Uh, and the, the main reason is actually something that Nathan told me. Um, if I wanted to publish my Firebase uh, abstraction into NPM, it wouldn't work because gulp wouldn't go to node module to say, oh, I'm gonna pick up TNS files or the, the web file, right? You wouldn't do that. But if we do that, uh, the build process with Webpack, we could actually set it up so that we could actually, I could give you that uh, native, sorry, that Angular module as uh, just one NPM module and the build would take care of that, right? So that's, that's the idea. Um, up, the upgrading your existing project. So very often, like, if you already have an existing web project and you say, oh, now I wanna add native script to it. Like we don't have like a clear path on how you migrate into a code sharing path just yet. I have an idea, like, you know, if you grab me, I was just like, yeah, just create a, a new project, copy the source folder and start adding the files. But it's not like a well-constructed step-by-step process just yet. It's something we're trying to figure out. So if any of you wants to go to migration, we, like give me a shout and maybe I can work with you on that to some extent and we can figure out the best method. But that's something we want to create is the migration process. Uh, and as well, like to help you get into it, like we try to like create some articles, some real life examples. So like the, um, the pet uh, project, the pet bros, uh, I'm going to make it look pretty in the next stage. 
uh, and then release it and as well like working on some workshops. So if you want to learn, I'll provide you some instructions you could follow step by step. And also like there'll be some serious examples, right? Like I like to do fun stuff, but uh, people want to see some serious stuff like, you know, what will you use uh, Salesforce on the back of it or, or different things, okay? So we'll definitely be working on all of that. There's some other small things, but these are the key things I'll be focusing uh, on in the next few stages. So I want to uh, welcome Nathan to the stage again. Um, I got an email, okay. Uh, which email? Uh, your progress. Oh, my progress. Uh, or do you have it there? Yeah. Because we can just switch. Okay. I don't want to show you my emails. <laughs> All right, let's see. Yeah, Nathan's project is really awesome. Like, when I seen it, I was like, why don't we do his thing instead of mine? It's uh, the, the seed, were you talking through this? N I have this, oh, you have but check, you, check, check, check. you can, there is a switch on top of it. It's check, about check, how check, much check. about technology check. I know. The, the seed project that I did is, is old, it's kind of ancient um, is the problem. It's based off of system JS, so you know, it is what it is, um, but uh, you should definitely check out this Team Meister one. It's really more of what um, the goals were in the beginning was to get to more something like that. Um, anyway, what I wanted to show was to basically reinforce what Sebastian is saying on this code sharing thing. Um, I just wanted to show a real world app that actually uses these concepts that Sebastian was talking about. This is an app that will be deployed this winter. Um, it's been in development since about May. Um, it's been a pretty interesting uh, code sharing project. Um, one of the more interesting aspects are reactive forms. So because of the way that Angular created these reactive forms, they create an awesome opportunity in code sharing to do some really powerful um, code sharing. So I, uh, the first thing that I wanted to show, and I'll try to make this brief, we got, what, 30 minutes? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so this uh, article, Todd Moto, who's an extremely talented developer uh, uh, out of London, uh, published this article, and this really inspired me um, when I saw this uh, for this particular project. Um, it goes through all these details on how to create these dynamically created form components um, and highlights the, all the strengths that Angular gives to do this. Um, a lot of them are created on the fly using the Create Component Resolver. Um, and I saw this and was reading through it and was thinking this is exactly how you could do code sharing for a fully data-driven dynamic form across web and mobile. Um, it really highlights all the essentials um, that really you would need to do. So I kind of took what Todd had done and I applied it to the full code sharing spectrum. So um, this next one I'll show here. Um, this is an app, disregard some of the images. Like I said, this is still um, very much in development. But uh, it is a fun holiday app that's going to come. It actually has been around for several years. Uh, kids use this to create these uh, videos um, to send to friends, but also parents can create these videos. And a lot of the video is created on the fly by what users enter in on the forms. And so these apps um, were built in Android and iOS and on the web. Uh, three totally different languages, three totally different code bases. And so we kind of came in and actually applied these principles that Sebastian was talking about and actually completely eradicated their entire Android code base and iOS code base and did it all with native script. Um, one of the key components is um, this abstraction uh, with the classes. So the, the main form that you're seeing here, the form on the right and the form on the left, uh, the left of course being the web, um, and we got a native script app on the right, Everything about that, um, these components are all shared, um, the code from them. That's an abstract class that is created in a common repo. This one in particular was done on three different repos, but the mono repo approach is certainly ideal. It depends on the case uh, for sure in the development team. There are certain things you got to understand about web development and native development to do it very uh, precisely in a mono repo, at least in the ideal spectrum. So. Um, this one in particular, because there were um, contractors involved and some of them were only web devs, um, this one was done in, in three different repos. But the common repo shares about, I'd say, close to 90% of what you see in both of these 
is um, shared uh, code. So the, the key element, like in Todd's um, article, is to have this abstraction. Um, let me go to that. Um, so this abstraction starts with this uh, store form base component. This is actually an abstract class, as you can see in TypeScript. Um, it extends a base component, which is also shared. So every single component in the code base, whether it's for web or for uh, mobile, native iOS and native Android, all extend this base component. And in particular, each form page, so the form on the web, form on the app, extend this base component. And in fact, here is what contains about 90% of all the code that drives it. Um, a lot of the data that drives those forms are actually from a backend, and the data uh, is pulled in, all sent through NGRX to populate a state of this form in which fuels the components. Um, so the key thing to understand is that to share all the code, you can't share templates because web is the DOM, native script is a totally different thing. So you can abstract all your component classes into these abstract classes. Um, I just realized I did not hit play on this. Um, so the key thing to see here is the form. This public form right here is actually what becomes populated at runtime on the web and in native script. And that form is populated by exporting a uh, form using Angular's export as um, directive, which I'll show. But this is an example of a form that extends that base component. So this is a mobile specific component that extends that base component, and then this view child has a mobile dynamic form component. This is all from Todd's article. Uh, the dynamic form component is the one that actually creates the reusable um, structure. So this is the same thing we were just seeing on NativeScript. This is the same thing in the web. So you can see it's exactly the same, only it uses a web dynamic form component. Um, so right here is a look at the dynamic form. So this is the base component that drives the dynamic form base. Um, so both the web dynamic form and the native script dynamic form both extend this. They each have references to the form group, which comes from Angular, and both of them can use that to validate their own forms. Then this, you can see that extends dynamic form base. This is in the web using export as. That is the key right there to actually populate the uh, form key in this shared abstract class. Okay, you can see this uses ng-container. This is straight from Todd Moto's article. ng-container is used to loop through a bunch of field configurations, and those field configurations are used to create uh, input components on the fly. And so the, the back-end data actually defines the type, whether it's a select field or an input field or a date field or a picture field. Um, all those things are defined in the back-end data. This is the look on native script. So this is actually using the same setup form group bound uh, here, and each of them are looping through the containers. NG containers work the same in native script as they do on the web. You can see this one exports the mobile dynamic form, and so that is what allows us to actually, again, define the form. This is the dynamic field directive. It works in concert with the whole setup. And again, this is straight from Todd Moto's. In fact, this code is almost unchanged from Todd Moto's article. This is, is the thing that creates the components on the fly based on what the field configuration is. So the resolve component factory, right there, the config type, that actually grabs a key hash that has a reference to each form component, whether it be on the web or on native mobile, and it will actually dynamically create those components in this setup right here. So this is a directive that goes on each uh, container, and so as it loops through the field configurations on ng on init, it actually dynamically creates those components um, and so you get the same data flow that's driving a form on web uh, and on native mobile. Um, so the last thing I was going to show is... Let's see. So I was going to show the final, re uh, the final result of it coming together. So there's a store, there's the store form base. That is uh, for the main uh, form. So that's like the form that's on the web and the form that's in the native mobile app. They both extend this, and then they work in tandem with the two other abstract classes. One of the abstract classes being the dynamic form itself, which has the ng container. That's the one that loops through and actually creates forms on the fly, input fields on the fly, I should say, not the form. But um, this is 
this represents the base level component for the exact same form on the web as it is on native script. And then, so there you see store form base. Um, we're looking at the uh, native script here. And then this is the actual implementation here that uses the dynamic bit right here. So app mobile dynamic form, the key that app mobile dynamic form is exported from the dynamic form. That's what I was uh, talking about that export as. And then these loop through and use the app dynamic field directive. This is just an example on native script here. So app mobile dynamic form, you can see, that's what's set as the actual form and that's what gives us reference to the form in actually the shared abstract class. So the shared abstract class has that public form sitting there, but it's actually not populated and referenced as the correct thing until it's actually run on the web or on native script. But on either one, it actually is the, di the form group that we have. Um, you can see on uh, those forms on the containers, let me go back to that, I don't know if you noticed that. Um, right. right there. On each of these, the ng container, and again, this is straight from Todd's article, the ng container is um, oh, a cut, this blank container that Angular can create components into. And so the app dynamic field directive, you'll see that on each of those containers there. That's what queues up the ng on init. And then based on the field that we pass it through the input, you can see that config binding is bound to the field. That field is coming through those field configurations that we pass it. And so the ng on init takes that field, looks at the configuration, says that's supposed to be an input field, that's supposed to be a select field, and then using Angular in the create component resolver, we dynamically insert these components, whether it be a web specific component or a native script specific component. Um, and that uh, is dynamic forms in a shared code base. So could I hook, hook this thing to my pet finder thing and uh, like you probably could. and use the petter? Yeah. So well, so that's a good point that Sebastian mentions. There is a good piece of this that actually could be wrapped up into a published module that people could reuse because a lot of this is kind of standard. There, there's a lot of it that can be abstracted into kind of the base set where there's the container where there's a way to configure your collections of these forms, whether it be driven by a backend data or whether it just be driven by data that you have in your app. It doesn't have to come from a backend source. Um, this app in particular, management wanted to be able to control each form in the holiday season. Because the holiday season, their prime is between, you know, end of November to <laughs> first, second week of January. Um, and so because during that time, they don't have time to have developers come in and create a whole new form um, just to kind of create a new gift. Um, so what they can do is get into the back end and, and just ins insert into the data a whole different field configuration. Um, it could be a form that creates a totally new kind of gift. They can do that on the fly. Uh, doesn't need any type of update in the app store because this picks up and pulls all the data for the form, of course, from the back end API and the apps just dynamically create them on the fly based on whatever management says they want them to be. So yeah, there's a piece of it that can be reused and shared possibly in a, in a public module. How exactly we'd go about that to make it configurable for people who use it would be the biggest thing to try to make a decision. That's a hard decision on what piece of this should we make customizable, what should come out of the box, what should the default be, and that sort of thing. But I think there will be some type of public thing that comes out of this where you could drop it into your project and get dynamic forms on the web and in native script. Nice. Check it out. I mean, I think I should just add it to my slides for my goals and objectives to kind of make it happen. Because like, what you guys, like you'd want it, right? <laughs> Data-driven UI. No promise timeline. Yeah, well, of course, right? 2022 for the next Olympic Games. So I have just last few things I want to show. Uh, in no specific order. Let me see. Come on, bring, show me the stuff. All right, cool. So,
just to recap, uh, if you want to uh, find the Team Maestro seat, uh, that's the link, github.com slash Team Maestro slash Angular Native seat. Uh, that's one of them that you want to uh, see. Uh, the Petbros project I was showing you, uh, you can also see it on GitHub. I'll be updating with some changes. So that's basically following me. Uh, so it's github.com slash sebavita slash pet dash bros, uh, because reasons. Uh, there's also, I created like um, uh, an examples project, which is just basically very basic examples uh, based on that seed. So again, sebavita slash angular native seed dash uh, examples. Uh, so you could go and have a look. Uh, you don't like, the best thing is that I also wrote quite a lengthy article. It's only like 27 pages or something. And it's got loads of Garfield, Garfield jokes and stuff, so it's pretty amazing. I should probably switch it off. Uh, yeah, I, I always have like some Garfield books next to my bed because like, that puts me to sleep laughing. Um, if any of you comes and asks me for my slides, uh, don't ask me, just go to my Twitter. So I just tweeted them. So if you go to uh, Seba Vita, like that's my last tweet that's over there. And pretty much the most important message, uh, Brian told me that there's some drinks on the second floor. Uh, so do not disappear. Come to us, have some drink with us, uh, and you know, uh, enjoy the day. And I'll probably see you tomorrow, right? Don't drink too much. I want to see you tomorrow, okay? All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>